Acacia is um, an associate professor uh, and she's at Hiram um, College in the US and uh, she completed her PhD at the University of Pennsylvania in 2009 and University of Pennsylvania is one of the leading places in positive psychology, um, had one, uh, the first MAP program there and um, she's the associate editor of Journal of Positive Psychology and the chief scientist um, for the Happify app. And she's going to be talking to us today about a range of her different research interests, um, and in particular about positive psychology uh, interventions, both for clinical samples and non-clinical samples, uh, which is the populations that she's been working with. And she uses innovative models of implementation, uh, in particular websites and smartphone apps. And you'll get to hear about a smartphone app in particular called Happify that is really um, spreading across the world and is something that hopefully you'll get to uh, download and have a try uh, for yourselves. If you haven't already, maybe you might be inspired after Acacia's talk. So if you could um, warmly welcome Acacia to come up to the stage and present her presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Good evening, or is it the middle of the night? I'm not so sure. Uh, I'm still working on the time difference. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you tonight about using technology to improve well-being. Um, I'm going to talk about why it's important to think about improving the well-being of the world, but I also hope that um, while you see the potential for that and the importance of it, you'll also walk away with the sense that we're not doing it yet. We're not ready. We're not there. Uh, and much more work needs to be done to get to the point where we can use what we know about how to improve well-being to actually take it to scale so that it can reach people and actually um, help people on a broad level. So, I'm going to talk about some research that I'm doing with Happify, trying to take positive psychology to the general public. But I'm also going to talk to you a little bit about the journey of how I got to doing that. So what research led to me having the sense that this was important work. Uh, so it, it'll be kind of half story, uh, half research presentation. So uh, everybody in this room probably has a, a relatively broad range of backgrounds. Some people are going to know exactly the research uh, body of research I'm referring to, and some won't be familiar. So I'm going to start with a little bit of overview, um, get everybody on the same page. Um, <clears throat> but first, a little bit more about who I am. Um, so uh, you heard a little bit from Diane. Um, I am a professor. I um, also work on a variety of academic projects. So I have some edited volumes on positive psychological interventions and teaching and higher education applications. Um, but I'm also uh, getting really into technology. Um, so this, uh, this red doohickey here is a picture of something called an actigraph, which is a device I use in my lab to track people's sleep duration quality and also their general physical activity. It's not that different from a Fitbit or a Jawbone Up or any of these other wearable bits. Uh, it just has slightly more sophisticated software. Um, but I'm, I, one of the things I want to tell you a little bit about is the potential, I think, in looking at the data from wearables and tying those to well-being outcomes and trying to see how the things that we, we think are improving people's health, really actually looking at health outcomes uh, to see if that's the case. Uh, and then I'm going to tell you about a couple of technological ventures that I've been involved in, um, a smartphone app called Live Happy. You can see a picture of it there, um, and Happify. Um, but I also like to tell people a little bit about myself. Um, so I uh, was once a pig farmer. So I live in rural Ohio. And the first thing we did when we moved to rural Ohio, my husband and I are both from cities, 
uh, was think, well, what can we do here that, to get excited about rural Ohio? And the answer was pigs. So that's Violet. She's 650 pounds and had 13 piglets in her. <laughs> when I uh, took that picture, she was pregnant in the middle of summer and I was scrubbing her down with baby oil because she was itchy. <laughs> so uh, yes, one, one time pig farmer. Uh, I also really like to do Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Uh, so that's a, a lovely picture of somebody getting choked with legs, which is kind of my favorite thing. <laughs> so you know, we're all humans and don't talk about it that much, but um, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm geeky into positive interventions uh, and technology, but uh, it's just a little bit about me and my, my uh, background. So just to get everybody on the same page here, um, happiness is important. You, this seems obvious, but actually there's a lot of skepticism out there, at least in the American general public, um, though I've sort of faced it with every audience I've discussed. Um, People seem to, lay people, think that happiness is important. If you ask them what makes life worth living, happiness is a part of that. Um, extensive research suggests that happiness is not just a byproduct of being successful. That is, it's, you know, if you're successful, then you'll feel happy. It turns out it's basically the other way around, that if you, um, if you are happy, you are more likely to find success in various domains of life. Uh, so some research has really looked at that and established that causal direction, that happiness seems to lead to better life outcomes, more, um, more income, longer lifespan, better relationships, all sorts of things. Um, so uh, happiness kind of leads to long-term effects, even though it's a relatively transient mood state. It doesn't last very long, but um, through processes outlined by Barb Fredrickson and colleagues, um, a little bit of happiness now seems to lead to long-term benefits. I could give a whole lecture on that, and I won't, but um, if you want to learn more, you can ask me after. Um, and it's self-maintaining. So once you make a person happy, um, there's real potential for that to stick around instead of it just being a single thing that you uh, induce very briefly. Once people find the ability to make themselves happy, they can kind of maintain that. And uh, many people admit that happiness is something that they want to pursue. So there's very much uh, a demand for ways to pursue happiness. Um, and actually, another thing I could give a whole lecture on is uh, the plethora of products and books and so on out there that promise that they will make you happy with no real empirical basis. Um, so the demand is great, and there are many people on the market trying to fill that demand irresponsibly. So uh, that's part of what got me interested in the idea of um, ha doing research-based happiness interventions and disseminating them, because if I don't disseminate them, if we don't disseminate them, someone else will disseminate something else, um, and it, it may not be helpful. Uh, I'm going to skip this. Um, <clears throat> so those of you who have taken MAP courses or who are familiar with positive psychology are going to recognize um, the sort of classic positive psychology exercises. Things you might have heard of, things like the gratitude journal or three good things, um, using strengths, uh, best possible selves, acts of kindness, savoring. I'll give examples of these later. Um, but um, basically, what I want to show you here is that um, there is a relatively extensive literature, given that it only started about 15 years ago. It's a pretty extensive literature. Um, finding that there are a lot of individual techniques that if one practices them for a few weeks, at the end of that few weeks, their well-being is improved. And if they continue to practice it, their well-being remains improved. Um, Meta-analyses have kind of looked at these uh, types of activities all together and agree. Um, there seem to be a variety of activities that you can give separately or in packages that improve well-being. So two meta-analyses both kind of reach the same general conclusions that overall um, positive interventions are effective with small to moderate effect sizes. Um, and there are certain factors that predicted better response. And this is one of those things that um, you'll see later I tried to take away and implement when we were putting together Happify. Um, that in general, single activities, even though most of the research uses single activities, here, write a gratitude letter, here, keep a gratitude journal, here, go do savoring, that the single activities don't actually work that well compared to activity um, packages where people are asked to do several things uh, in, a, in a group. Uh, so with a greater number of activities, um, when they're asked to practice for a longer duration. Um, if, the, if the intervention is administered in person, um, which, 
you'll see later I'm not that excited about, but um, if they are administered in person, it's better to do it one-on-one -on -one versus having, say, 12 or 16 people learning, um, learning different activities. Uh, it's better to do it individually. Um, if a participant decides that they want to do it, if they, for example, read an ad for a study that says, hey, come do some happiness activities, uh, people tend to respond better. They self-select themselves, right? They're interested, and interest is important. Um, compared to samples where they just said, hey, come do a study where we learn about everyday behaviors. Uh, you get different people in that kind of context. So it's important um, that people are motivated. Um, older age, um, more de depression or distress, um, these things seem to predict outcome as well. Okay, so we have this overall literature that finds that well-being can be increased reliably, um, that it works particularly for people who are more distressed, and um, it, it works better if you give people a variety of different activities and you ask them to spend a while working on them, not just a week or two. There are studies where they just say do this for a week. Those effects are smaller. So <clears throat> that all sounds good, but there's a really big problem, which is how are people going to get these things? And this is not a problem that is unique to positive psychology. So uh, there are many interventions uh, out there that have 10, 15, 20 years of research, um, finding that they're effective uh, and documenting them and making it so that any clinician can pick them up and do them but a clinician has to do them for them to work. And it takes maybe 16 people at a time, right? So if you think about anything that requires a single clinician to run 16 people at a time, and your goal is the world, that's a lot of clinicians, that's a lot of time. Um, so even when you get into these kinds of, um, uh, I'll, I'll give you some examples of very simple online interventions where people just kind of come and get some instructions and then they're asked to go do an intervention and come back. Who's going to do that? Who's actually going to be motivated to do that? When was the last time somebody sent you an email and said, do this, and then uh, tell me how it went in a week, and you actually remember to do it and email them? It's, it's, not, very, um, it's not very feasible. So the types of uh, interventions that you'll see in the literature, if you go and read, most of them are not scalable in any way. They're not something that could get picked up by the general public. Um, they would be very difficult to implement. And that's a problem. Um, in the US, 20 to 25 percent will develop a mental disorder in their lives, and this rate, depending on which survey you look at, is even higher in Australia. So some say, 20 to 25 percent, others say up to 45 percent will at some point in their lives be affected by a mental illness. Okay, so that's a serious problem. But even more serious is the fact that two-thirds, and this is true in both the U.S. and Australia, two-thirds will never receive treatment. Part of that is because they, um, they might not be able to get treatment, but another piece of it is that they may not want treatment. They may be stigma. Um, there may be logistical problems, uh, but there are a variety of reasons, especially among the 16 to 34 set where prevalence is highest, um, two-thirds don't receive treatment. Okay, so just to recap, uh, pretty substantial proportion of the population of uh, both your country and mine dealing with uh, mental disorder, and most of those people aren't ever going to get treated for it after onset. So. Uh, a, Furthermore, another 10 to 15 percent, or maybe more, um, depending on who you ask, have sub-threshold symptoms. So they don't have a disorder, but they have enough symptoms that it's affecting them. It's making it hard to be productive at work or in school. It's doing things that impair their lives, um, but may not be eligible for treatment, right? So health insurance might not reimburse the treatment of something that doesn't meet DSM criteria. Okay, so lots of people with mental illness um, and our treatment systems are not really working to deal with that. For whatever reason, people are not getting into treatment. Another thing I could talk about for an entire hour, right? Why people don't get treatment. But for now, let's just accept that uh, lots of people going untreated. So that's bad, <laughs> right? Um, and uh, part of what inspired me to get into the work that I do is seeing this disconnect 
and thinking about the idea of preventing mental disorders from happening in the first place. So um, that was something I was very interested in in undergraduate and in graduate school was, okay, so if we wait till a person has a disorder, their chances of getting treatment are not so great. So that's all the more reason to try and get further um, earlier in time to prevent them from getting to that point where they have a disorder which then isn't gonna get treated. So I really got thinking about um, prevention and later my advisor, uh, Marty Seligman, had encouraged me to think about um, not just prevention, that is like getting rid of some negative risk factor, but wellness. That if we can make people mentally healthy, um, then that's hard to coexist with depression. If we can make a person resilient uh, to stress and give them the skills they need to maintain a positive perspective in life, that depression is going to be less likely to overtake them. There's tons of data, by the way, to um, confirm that that is actually true. Uh, most of the positive interventions have even more profound effects on depressive symptoms than they do on happiness. Um, so we have a lot of evidence that for, depress, uh, for depressive symptoms all the way from you know, mild subclinical to pretty severe, that happiness-based approaches are reducing symptoms despite the fact that they don't really focus on disorder. So it seems to be important to think about widespread dissemination of positive interventions because there's this great potential to potentially uh, reduce risk and reduce symptom levels among people at a population level. <clears throat> but as I was suggesting before, intervention science so far kind of fails at dissemination. We're really good, um, and I know more about what, you know, the examples from the United States, but we're really good at developing programs, resilience and well-being and prevention programs, testing them in tightly controlled environments, using lots and lots of research funding to get them looking beautiful and, uh, and really well proven. Proven's the wrong word, but you know, well established as having efficacy and then leaving them in some format where they're never going to be taken up or where they're never going to make it to the general public. Um, so this has been going on for my entire career, basically. I watch the same interventions sit there, not getting used, even though they're great, uh, because there's not a plan for how to get them there. So positive psychology has done okay, but not well enough to impact the well-being of the world. And if that is our goal, we have a lot of work to do. So <clears throat> given that the population of the world is uh, you know, 7.4 billion people, uh, when we are looking at studies with sample sizes of 200, we're missing something. You know, we're not seeing studies with even sample sizes of 1,000. Uh, how are we ever gonna get to 7.4 billion? So that's kind of my, the question that I want to um, spend the rest of this lecture on, um, just trying to walk through how I've tried to address this problem in my research and leave you with some questions or things that I'm planning to do in the future and hopefully inspire some new ideas. So, the first idea I had, and I had this actually as an undergraduate, was self-help books because I read about this thing called bibliotherapy where you can give somebody a book that carefully documents what's in cognitive therapy. Everybody know what cognitive therapy-ish? Anybody not know? Okay, so it, anyway, um, it's a, it, yeah, it's a therapy approach for depression, very common, um, very heavily research-based, and I found numerous studies that did randomized trials and found that if you gave a person a book that explains everything a therapist would explain to you about cognitive therapy, that depression improves, even clinical depression. You read the book, it explains how to do cognitive therapy, you teach yourself, you do it, whoa, depression goes away. Amazing, right? This blew my mind. This is what defined my entire career, the finding that you could put therapy in a book and have it work. You can see where this could naturally extend to you know, internet applications and how I started to get inspired with that. Um, so my undergraduate thesis was actually using a, a depression um, CBT self-help book trying to prevent depression among college students. And uh, when I got to the Positive Psychology Center at Penn, Marty, uh, and Marty was starting to really think about well-being, I kind of shifted that focus and started thinking about self-help books. Um, that are science-based from positive psychology. So here are some, here's a, a, 
a picture of some of them. Uh, I am particularly focused on um, Sonia Lubomirsky's The How of Happiness, which many MAP students have read. Uh, but this book is full of re heavily research-based techniques, direct, almost directly out of the science. It's very true to the science. So I thought, well, if any book in this uh, you know, playing field is going to be effective for improving well-being without a human, uh, being involved, it's going to be the how of happiness. So I did a randomized trial with uh, my student Rebecca Santo um, when this was my first year at Hiram College. And uh, so we randomly assigned people to either read the how of happiness or that cognitive behavioral self-help book. I had extra copies and I was like, what am I going to do, right, from my, my undergraduate study? So I was lugging this book around, um, this uh, box full of many copies of the books. Um, so we threw that in there as well, so we could compare these two approaches, which I thought was pretty neat. Um, and then we had a control condition where people just monitored their mood. So they were doing more than nothing, but um, it was essentially a waitlist control group. And um, we assessed them on CESD, which is depressive symptoms, uh, and we looked at them across pre, post, and six-month follow-ups. And as you can see here, what we found is that in the control group, people, these are college freshmen, naturally just kind of got more depressed over time. This is not the first data set on college freshmen that I've had where I see this trend, where they kind of get to college and it just gradually um, gets a little worse for them. To give you a sense of where they are in um, depressive symptoms, an 18 is mild clinical levels. So the average in this sample, I did not screen for depression, I did not only take people who were depressed, they were starting off in the kind of mild to moderate depressed range already. Um, and uh, what you can see is that both the positive and the cognitive self-help books uh, led to substantial improvement. And then six months later, some of it went away, uh, but not all of it. So um, statistically, they had a significant improvement. Um, it just wasn't as big as it might have been if, say, I had systematically asked them to continue doing the activities they had learned. This was completely just, I hand you a book. Um, so in that first pre-post period, they had a syllabus. They were supposed to read this chapter here and this chapter here and this chapter here. Then when all the structure goes away, you can see that um, some of the effect starts to disappear. So I took a couple things out of this. One, whoa, cool. Right? So uh, this positive intervention was com uh, comparable to a cognitive behavioral intervention. Um, and I also saw that we had people coming down to almost not depressed anymore. Right? 12, below 12 is sort of uh, non-clinical, you know, uh, non-major non symptoms. So it's, you know, not a, not a tiny decrease that people experienced. But the other thing I noticed is, oh man, it goes away. Right? So effort to have continued engagement is really, really important. Um, and that's where I started thinking about smartphone apps. Because when I hand them a book, right, the book is not going to be like, hey, don't forget, to do, uh, don't forget to do your activity today. Right? A book's not going to remind you. Um, so I, I kind of felt heartened, but at the same time felt like the book is not my end point. Right? The book's not enough. Even though it's pretty cheap, it's about six bucks a book. Um, you know, maybe each uh, individual person in the world could uh, figure that out. It might not last, right? We're seeing that it doesn't necessarily last. Um, so uh, another interesting thing that we looked at was people's um, ratings of how much they liked the positive versus cognitive self-help book. So although they responded the same in terms of their depressive symptoms. Um, if you look at uh, some of these variables, so this was frequency was how often they used it. Um, enjoyment was how much they enjoyed it when they used it. Um, effectiveness was how effective they believed it would be for them. Meaning is how meaningful they felt what they were doing was. So how you know, meaningful did they think that the activity they were doing uh, was in the scheme of their life, and then um, again how, oh right, effectiveness was how effective they felt it was, and then confidence was more just like generally how confident that they feel that this was a worthwhile thing to do. So there weren't significant differences on confidence or perceived effectiveness, so everybody believed in both of the books. Um, but when it came to feeling like what they were doing was meaningful, and actually choosing to do it and whether or not they enjoyed it, people preferred the positive self-help approach. 
they seemed to find it more enjoyable. So that was another thing that I found really interesting. It's kind of consistent with some other literature, um, but it gave me the sense that maybe I was on the right track with this positive psychology kind of approach because if I tell you to go get a root canal because you might later need one, you're not gonna do it, right? Um, if I have you do something that's fun and exciting and interesting anyway um, to improve your mental health, you're more likely to be interested than if I ask you to do something that's difficult. Um, and I'm a trained cognitive therapist. Uh, I mean, I, I don't want to say I'm a cognitive therapist because I don't do cognitive therapy, but I spent two years in cognitive therapy practicum. Um, so I'm familiar with what it's like, and what it's like is difficult. It's great, it's powerful, it's effective, but it is not easy. Right? Cognitive therapy is not easy. Um, and it involves directly engaging with and thinking about your problems, which not everybody wants to do. So I thought that was really interesting, and it sort of inspired me to both feel like there was progress, but also that we needed more. Okay, so it was equally effective on uh, one measure. Uh, I, I skipped because of time on um, the subjective well-being because it was um, a little messier. So you see the positive self-help looks better, but like not all of this was significant. So I'm not gonna say that the positive self-help was better. Let's just go with this story where they were basically equal, um, but if you wanted to look at this graph and make an interpretation that the positive psych um, did a little bit better, that, um, that's what it looks like. But like I said, the sample was too small to know if that was real. Um, so uh, it was equally effective on one measure. Um, it, it may have been more effective on the other measure. Um, and it was better liked by participants um, on several of our preference indices. Okay. But of course the problem with the books is that they require sustained effort. So they might work immediately, but long term there are some concerns. They're not that engaging. Um, one thing that I didn't put on here, I don't think, is um, books also require a certain reading level. Right? So if there's one thing that I've learned, uh, working with uh, Leslie Hausman at the Pittsburgh VA, we were developing a, I'm sorry, that's the Veterans Hospital in the United States, we developed a chronic pain intervention for veterans. What do you suppose the average reading level is for the veterans treated at the VA? Hmm? It's lower than, take what you think it is and lower it by several grade levels and that's what it needs to be, right? Because not everybody had equal education. Um, and it's the same with, you know, if I'm, if I'm taking this uh, b book that's written at a relatively high level, lots of text, that's not gonna work for all audiences. Um, also may not be obviously appealing to the younger, more digitized generations who are glued to their cell phones. I say that like that doesn't apply to me, but. <laughs> um, it doesn't track your activity, so you, know, you might keep a spreadsheet uh, that makes a graph if you wanted to be hardcore about it, but um, in general, your, um, your self-help book isn't gonna do anything to help you see how you're progressing, um, which lots and lots of behavior change research tells us is important. You need to see how, um, how you're making gains. So I got involved in um, a paper that I did with Steven Schuler. Um, this was my first web intervention. This is two studies I'm gonna talk about here. So the first bullet point about web-based um, positive interventions. Uh, I, for my dissertation, I ran some studies looking at both individual activities and packages. So um, do these two activities over two weeks or these four activities over four weeks or these six activities over six weeks. These are really bare bones though. This is like you go to the website and you read some text and that's the end, right? There's no text message to tell you to come back. Um, there's, no, there's nothing coaching you on how to do it or how often to do it. There's no social network to share it with. It's really just a self-help book delivered briefly on a website. So um, we started with that. We thought we were so cutting edge, right? We're so pleased with ourselves when we were doing this. This is back in um, the early 2000s. Um, but what we found is that although these um, types of interventions worked when people did them, people didn't really do them, right? We had some people who did them, but the dropout rates were so massive because it wasn't engaging, right? There's nothing engaging about a blank web page that gives you some text. And then we come back to the text problem, right? Now people have to um, you know, read a lot of text to understand what they're supposed to do. 
uh, it, it was problematic. So yeah, you know, we published a paper being like, web-based PPIs, it works. But it works for whoever sticks around, and whoever sticks around is not enough people. Um, so not totally enthused with that, even though it worked in a, a literal sense, right? Compared to a control group, people did better. Um, so I was uh, pleased to get involved with a project that Sonia Lubomirsky was working on where um, she worked with a company called Signal Patterns to create an app called Live Happy that was based on her book. I'm like, perfect, right? I've been studying this book. Okay, so here's the app version of the book. It should be you know, easier, um, easier to access. It should be more engaging. Um, so I was interested in seeing how these types of interventions translated into a smartphone environment. So I realize I don't actually cite this. Oh, no, I cite it up there. OK. So um, it contains eight activities, um, a savoring activity. Um, actually, remembering happy days is also a savoring activity, but it's a memory savoring activity. So mostly savoring is like an experience right now. Am I enjoying this activity, trying to make it so that I'm um, <clears throat> living in the moment? An act of kindness activity, um, an activity for strengthening relationships, and so on. And people had free choice across all these activities. So they could do the same one every day. They could do different ones and mix it up. Um, and this allowed us to look at different types of behavior patterns to see what patterns predicted um, better outcomes. So already, things are looking really much better in terms of research design, right? So instead of here, I throw you this web page and I don't know whether you even read it, let alone whether you did it. Now we've got an app where they actually enter that they did it and which activity they did and we know when they did it because it's time stamped and ah, beautiful data, so much data. Um, but um, already we're able to look at kind of usage variables and other things of concern that we couldn't in a more um, static intervention study. So um, in one study we did, uh, we had people who had used the app, so they purchased it from the, this was from the iPhone store, um, I think it was 99 cents. And uh, so these are people who had purchased the app and um, who had taken the well-being assessment inside the app um, twice. So that cuts down the, the number of people by quite a lot because a lot of people, I mean, how many, how many of you have downloaded an app and never even opened it? Decent number of people. How many of you have downloaded an app, opened it once, and never opened it again? Right? Now we're talking. So when, <laughs> right, when you look at the number of people who have registered for an app or you know, have opened it up uh, enough to have a username, that doesn't, that's very different from using it often enough that they could complete, for example, two well-being assessments and enough activities to put time between those two assessments. So relatively small sample, even though many more people purchased the app. Um, and what we found is that the mood scores improved significantly from pre to post, um, and that it especially, uh, we especially saw that among people who used it more, which hopefully is, that's pretty obvious, right? More usage means um, more, uh, better outcomes, but also that greater variety of activities um, was predictive. So this is the study from which that I make that conclusion. Um, we found that if a person you did the gratitude visit every day, their outcomes weren't as good as someone who made the same amount of effort but divided it across different activities. This is the kind of thing that like, I really wanted to know. So I got excited when I started to be able to look at this sort of data. Um, but even here, there were some problems. Um, so one was um, that, the, um, like I said, the usage was still pretty ugly. Right? So the drop-off rate, um, the total number of people who bought the app versus the number of people who actually had accessible data, that was a huge gap. So that says that, obviously, um, when people download an app, some are just never really that interested in it. But one would hope that some people would find it engaging enough to stay. Um, and so we worried that perhaps a standalone app wasn't um, necessarily an optimal solution for keeping people because we're still seeing these problems with retention where very few people were staying long enough for us to actually see whether the app was helping them. Um, so that's when I started thinking about Happify and I actually basically gave this talk up to this point at a conference in 2011 and two entrepreneurs were in the audience and I said you know this is 
you know, kind of a bummer. I've been involved in some startup companies. It's never really worked, but I really want to put this on the web in a way that will reach people. And they were like us too. <laughs> and a conversation about Happify began um, back in 2011. So we worked together basically based on all of this research I had done and all of these lessons that I had take away, uh, taken away from that research um, to create what I think is an innovative emotional health and well-being platform designed to build resilience and help people feel better about their lives. So we started to put this together and I want to tell you about it as a case study of a way to scale interventions. So it's not the way to do it, although we have had some success um, just with consumers, some success with businesses, um, and also some success in school settings. So there is the potential for something like Happify to fit in a lot of large scale organizational settings. Um, but I kind of want to show it just as an example of how we can make that next leap from studies with samples of a couple hundred people to a much larger kind of sample size, uh, where we're looking at a much larger proportion of the world, not the world, right? We're not there yet, but um, a larger proportion of it. So uh, the basic idea behind the site is um, that there are these four-week programs called tracks. And each of these tracks has a function. So um, if, I, uh, if I had the goal of coping with stress better, there's a track called Coping with Stress Better. And it gives me a series of activities that help me cope with stress better. Um, we have some uh, more specific ones as well. So for example, um, we just released uh, yesterday a diabetes track. So it's uh, designed based on research on improving the well-being of people with diabetes and helping them manage their diabetes better. Um, so we have those kinds of uh, more specific goals as well. Um, but the idea is that each track gives um, a set of activities. So right now, this is just a list of, um, of activities. But if I picked one of those, I would be it would be described to me how to do the activity. So this is a letter to my future self. Um, you get some uh, example of what you're supposed to do. And then you're given a text field where you type in what happened. So um, in the case of this, you're supposed to write a letter to yourself uh, five years from now. Um, you don't necessarily have to type in the content of what you did, but you at least want to reflect on it um, in the website. We can come back to that later, because I have all this text data for people, which is also cool. Uh, but the idea is that they're more likely to do it if you give them a place where they can actually enter in what they've done. Um, so if I ask people to write down three good things that happened to them, there are three fields. They write down each of the three good things. Um, so if they, have a, yeah, if they do pick a track, um, then it gives them every week a couple of activities, and then it unlocks new activities each week. You'll see this thing here where it has um, these different categories of activities where you get points, so you can like level up in the different types of skills. Um, I'll tell you in a minute what the skills are, but you can see up there, there are these little icons and places where people build experience. We actually got a game designer to come consult on the site when we were first building it, so there are some built-in um, engagement things like that. Okay, so I made this little chart to demonstrate how I basically took the science as I read it and turned it into Happify, um, or how I advised Happify to um, create itself. So in the upper left, I started with this idea that um, there are these ways to improve well-being uh, using positive psychology, some cognitive behavioral approaches, some mindfulness approaches. All of these things have merit um, and a massive literature behind them that suggests that well-being can be improved. So this all starts with that premise, right? If you don't believe that, you can't build Happify. Um, from there, I uh, picked up a couple of research findings. So for example, in that um, web study I told you guys about, um, one of the things we found is that between a two, four, and six week intervention, four weeks was actually better than six weeks. So there's something about four weeks. It's long enough that it feels substantive, uh, but it's not so long that it, uh, that it gets to be too much. So uh, we arrived at this idea of having tracks be four weeks long. So every track we have is that duration. Um, we found, as I mentioned in that study before, that variety is important. So tracks aren't just like here, do three good things. Here, do it again, do it again. They offer variety because we know that although people don't necessarily choose variety, 
right? People don't necessarily choose what's going to lead to the best outcome for them. Variety is good. So uh, we make sure that they get offered variety. Um, we also know from previous research that more usage leads to improvement, but usage is an issue, right? Dropout is an issue. Um, it's hard to keep people engaged, so we use gamification principles to maximize user engagement. Um, <clears throat> and we developed a questionnaire to measure happiness um, split in two ways, um, positive emotion and then um, life satisfaction. So that's kind of how do you feel about your life, how you feel lately, but then also do you think your life's in good shape? Do you think you're making the right choices in life? Do you think that you're getting where you want to be? So those are our two main outcomes. And all this is research driven, right? None of this is just something I made up because we had to make something up. This is all drawing on studies. So <clears throat> I did a comprehensive review of activities from all these literatures. Um, there's probably more from positive psych than anything else, but we felt it was important to give credit to um, cognitive therapy, which has a good research basis as a preventive tool. Right? Not just as a therapy, but as something that can help people um, prevent depression or avoid depression. And I even found, you know, in my own work with the uh, bibliotherapy, that when I give people a cognitive behavioral book, it works, it works too. So uh, we wanted to uh, include some of those and also some mindfulness activities which have extraordinary benefits for anxiety um, and general stress management. So we got all of these activities together, drawn from each field required that they had at least one random assignment controlled study. Um, in many cases, they have much more than that. And our idea was to translate those interventions into um, an engaging platform. I'm about to skip a bunch of slides, but you can totally have them later if you ask me, so don't be sad. Um, so I want to really quickly just review that for each of these areas, it's not just that they're effective for improving well-being. So up here you see, yeah, okay, um, increases well-being, reduces depressive symptoms. Positive psych in interventions also have demonstrated efficacy for smoking cessation, reducing chronic pain, generalized anxiety disorder, cancer, um, that is helping people cope with having cancer, not doing anything about the cancer itself, just so we're clear, because um, people make that claim. Um, Cardiovascular disease, again, improving quality of life and treatment adherence, and also diabetes, um, it, uh, again, with a quality of life. So reducing depressive symptoms among people with chronic illness. So um, these, are, these are things that have real possibilities, not just in the general public, but among people who are um, dealing with serious uh, health and mental health problems. Same with cognitive therapy. You see chronic physical illnesses. Um, treatment of depression, anxiety, um, both clinical and non-clinical populations. So one ethical issue that always, I think, came up to me as I was designing a site like Happify is that I cannot control who comes on Happify. A person with major clinical depression can come on Happify. I won't even know, right? I can't, I can't stop that. So at what point do I have an ethical obligation to either make sure it's going to work for everybody who can wander on, which is very hard to do, um, or at least clearly understand who I can and can't help so that I can be clear about that on the site. So, yeah, I, in the very beginning I worried, ah, well, people might wander in and um, use this as a treatment. Um, and that's not our goal, but it makes me more comfortable to see that there's lots of evidence to find that uh, using, using these types of activities is very helpful in those clinical populations who are going to wander into the site no matter what we do. Um, mindfulness, again, also highly efficacious for uh, especially anxiety, um, resilience, uh, chronic pain, and other physical um, health problems, All, a lot of the same ones you saw for positive psychology, and then also obesity. So huge uh, body of literature for both kind of, uh, clinical and non-clinical populations suggesting that um, these types of approaches will be useful. So, this is a picture of um, what we call the STAGE framework, which is just an acronym to summarize all of the activities in these different fields. I'm not going to go through these in a lot of detail, um, but I will very quickly just breeze through the five broad categories of activities that we include. So the cupcake is savoring, right? So these are activities that involve 
uh, being in the present moment and intensely experiencing anything from memories to food to a social interaction. So these are ways to kind of be in the present moment with something uh, important. T is thank. Um, so that's going to be um, gratitude, basically. Um, so there are all sorts of different activities that people can use to foster gratitude. Um, and an example of this might be to think back over the past several years, remember an instance when someone did something for you that you're extremely grateful for, uh, and uh, spend time contemplating your gratitude. So yeah, the T is uh, all of these different gratitude activities. Um, a is aspire. These are optimism activities, which are a lot of CBT, actually. Um, a lot of reframing and thinking about things positively, goal setting, um, making meaning from things by writing, um, and also thinking about your strengths and how to use them. Um, G is give. So these are all the pro-social behavior type interventions you might have heard of, acts of kindness. Um, pro-social pro spending, um, and also some forgiveness activities. <clears throat> and then lastly, empathize. So these are um, activities to help one uh, both empathize with themselves, have self-compassion, but also take the perspective of other people in their lives. I like this picture of the, the brain and the heart holding hands. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so in my last few minutes, I just want to talk a little bit about the future directions. So you've seen why I wanted to make an engaging online tool for um, trying to improve well-being. And at this point, Happify has uh, over 3 million users. So we have indeed reached uh, a large number of people. But I also want to ask new questions. So I don't want to just be like, yeah, sure, we took this research and put it online. It's probably working, right? Um, so <laughs> the red boxes are uh, questions that I want to ask, that I want to, uh, that I want to know now that we're collecting data using this massive online platform. Um, some of these I've even talked about doing with people here at the University of Melbourne. So it's very exciting um, thinking about, you know, looking at what gamification actually does to improve outcomes. So one thing I haven't talked about is that Happify has these games in it. Um, these engaging, it's, it's amazing actually that when, whenever anybody does a write-up in a news outlet, the first thing they talk about is the games. It's the first thing that they noticed. It's the first thing that they played. Um, so how much are those helping to maximize user engagement? Um, what's the difference in engagement with people who use these versus not? Um, what about other kinds of outcomes? So I really focus on well-being right now, but um, what about, uh, what about health-related outcomes? Um, so I promised I would talk a little bit about um, wearables, and one thing I really want to do is sync up with people who wear Fitbits or Jawbone Ups or other kinds of um, health-related data collectors and see what happens to people's health when they use these types of activities. Um, and are certain aspects of the site more predictive of improvement on these things than others? Um, we're also really getting into health populations, so we're doing a study um, with diabetes sufferers, um, trying to see whether we actually see improvements in um, how well people are managing their diabetes uh, based on their well-being. So if their well-being improves, they're optimistic about their ability to manage their diabetes, does that actually lead to health improvements? Um, and also, obviously, I just want to make sure everything's going the way that it's expected, right? Based on the research, I, I hope that uh, what we put into Happify is going to perform the same way that everything in the research has. Uh, but I don't know until we, uh, until we test it. So that's another thing that has to happen. So I have a bunch of data that sadly I can't talk to you about. Um, but if you're interested, uh, I, can, I can go over it with anybody who wants to later. I also have papers and so on. But. Um, <clears throat> Um, one thing I really want to um, end with is thinking about the idea of taking a systematic approach or, or a systemic approach. Um, so Happify targets individuals and tries to make their lives better, right? We're trying to teach people to do individual things to make their individual lives individually better. But people don't actually live in individual bubbles. People live in family systems, work systems, societal systems. So an intervention like Habify, as, as long as it is individually focused, um, is going to ha have limitations. 
So how can we try and integrate thinking about the systems in which people live into an individually focused intervention? How can we change how we do intervention so that we take that into account? Um, and more importantly, how can we take what's uh, uh, affecting three million, which may seem like a lot, but it's really only three quarters the size of Melbourne, right? Three million is not a ton of people in the grand scheme of the world. How can we get from three million to 7.4 billion? Um, how can we create something that will both affect that number of people and do so effectively, uh, taking into account the systems in which they live. So even more scaling is needed, and I, I would argue too, rethinking the way that we do interventions so that we can um, leverage instead of fight against the fact that people are embedded in complex systems. So I've got a few minutes left, um, and uh, I, I'm trying to decide which of the many things I skipped I wanna take the time to tell you guys about. Um, <clears throat> So in the last couple minutes, I want to talk a little bit about an effort that we've made to implement Happify in a school setting. Okay, so, so far you've heard about a product that's consumer facing, fundamentally. Um, what that means is that the site is available, you could get it on your app, uh, on your phone right now, and you could use it. Um, and while there is free content that is excellent, there is also more advanced and specialized content that you could subscribe and pay for. So that's consumer facing, right? Individuals come uh, and, and get it if they want to. Um, but there's also the possibility of disseminating interventions through organizations. So another approach that we're taking is uh, working with companies. So companies who want to improve the well-being of their employees might approach us, and in fact they do, they email us out of the blue and ask, hey, can we um, give this to our employees? And then they distribute the products and encourage it in the workplace, and um, one would hope create op time and opportunity to use them in the workplace um, so that they actually get integrated in people's lives. That might be one way to think about systems, by the way. Right, as we're implementing things in systems, actually creating time um, within that, uh, that system for the intervention to become a part of it. But we've also done work with a group called Mayerson Academy in the United States, which currently um, works with a number of schools. And uh, we, we did a program based on something called social emotional learning, um, which is a, a particular um, area of especially educational psychology, trying to focus on teaching kids emotional skills to cope. Uh, and we developed a children's specific um, track, so a four-week program, but for the kids um, in their schools. And I wanna just show you their, um, their webpage that talks about it um, so that you can just see some pictures of what we did. So I'm not gonna show you the video, it's, um, it's a little long, but they, um, basically, you'll see these images of kids in the classroom with a tablet. So they're using the app while they're in class, and class time has been created so that they can use the app. Um, the version that they had is particularly strengths-based, so they're really interested in the idea of teaching kids what their strengths are. Um, but basically, 6,000 kids got access to this app because a system of schools decided to disseminate it. So think about what would happen if, this, if the schools in an entire country decided to do that. If, if a, a set of lawmakers decided that they thought that this kind of approach was important enough that it could be disseminated in that way. Now we're starting to look at the world, right? If entire countries can look at a program and decide to adapt it, and I'm not saying it would have to be Happify, it could be anything, but if we're gonna talk about scaling, it's not gonna be individual consumers. I, hope, I mean, I hope everybody in this room has ideas of like what, what type of person goes after a self-help app, but it's not the average person, right? It's gonna be a specific subset of the population. I can tell you right now it's 80% female, um, and it's mostly 18 to 45, right? So we've got a very specific subset of the population that we hit with the consumer approach. So implementing in schools, implementing in organizations, it's gonna involve different people. Um, so in order to have the kind of scalability that I'm talking about, organizations are gonna be an essential part of that effort, not just an individual approach. And it's 6.55, so I'll stop there. Thank you.